Good morning everyone, welcome to Liquid Brain. So today we are talking about the hidden Markov model and its application in bioinformatics. So for those that heard this word before, it is not anything new. Uh, there's not really any new discovery recently. Um, as you see, uh, hidden Markov model had, had been described as early as the 1960s and the Markov process and Markov chain is actually much earlier. So I'm not going to go into the mathematics of the hidden Markov model as well as the Markov chain, but rather I want to focus on understanding the concept and how we can use it, which is why we're going to start with some things like Markov chain and Markov process and how does that lead to the Markov model building and what's actually hidden in a hidden, hidden Markov model situation here. And lastly, what application in bioinformatics, so how we can use this modeling and predictive power in the bioinformatics field. So before we go into, I want to tell a little bit of a story. So um, imagine you and your, in this case, my girlfriend, we go out for dinner and she, over, she will always, almost always order dessert. And the dessert that she order is going to be dependent on whether she order a coffee or not. So if she didn't order a coffee, the probability of her uh, getting an ice cream will be about 70%. Uh, about 10% she will order a cake and 20% she'll order a uh, jelly bean, okay? But of course, if she order a coffee during dinner, it's funny, but some people do that, the probability of ordering dessert is gonna change to 20% ice cream, 70% cake, or 10% jelly bean, okay? And the probability of her ordering a coffee is actually 70%, so 70% of the time she's gonna order a coffee, and 30% of the time she's not going to. And how would you build a model to understand your, your boyfriend and girlfriend better? So I think about it and I actually built this graph. Okay, so on the right side, you will see this is a very typical example of a Markov chain where you have different state and you have different state path. So all the squares here you can see are called states. Those are the observation or decision that you make. And all the arrows are called state path, which is the probability of one state that leads to another. So in this case, you start the dinner, and after the, so during the dinner, 30%, they will not have enough coffee. 70%, she'll have a coffee. Okay, that's what 0 0.3 and 0 0.7 means. And if she's not having a coffee, you most likely get an ice cream, cake and jelly bean with the red color probability number here. And if she do order the coffee, there'll be a 0 0.2, 0 0.7, 0 0.1 probability of order one of the three dessert over here down there. So this is a typical example of a Markov chain where you have different state and different state will have different state path that link interconnects one state to another. Okay, so this is an, uh, one of the other example that I pulled from Wikipedia where A can go to E, E can go to A and so on. So um, um, after we finish the basic of Markov, the, the basic of ordering dessert, there are also some edge cases where if you, we go out for dinner, there's a 10% chance if she order a cake, she'll actually order another cake. So what this illustrates is that the state, instead of actually just going only to the other state, it can actually go back to its, itself, okay? They might actually order two cakes, so, but only a 10% chance, not a very high chance, so she don't eat that much. Okay, so after that, um, so whatever we discussed just now is only for one day. So today, no coffee, cake, end of, the, end of the story. However, because relationship is a very long-term process and you know, you're know you gonna go out for dinner again and again and again and again and again, uh, we, can't, we have to build another model to predict what would happen on day two and day three and day four and day five and onwards. So in this case, I added a green color um, probability here. So what will happen the next day? So if day one, she has not ordered coffee, there's an 80% chance the next day she'll order coffee and 20% chance she'll not order coffee on day two and the subsequent dessert uh, decision processes follow. So for day two, if she order coffee, there's a 50% chance that she will not order coffee and there's a 50% chance she'll again order coffee on day three. So that repeats to day three where, you know, again, there's a 50% chance of ordering coffee or not. And maybe day four, there's no coffee and there's an 80-20% chance of ordering coffee or not on the next day. Okay, so this decision-making process can go on forever and ever and ever and ever. 
So if you have a model like that and you have a process that works somewhat like this, you can actually call this a Markov processes. So a Markov process is actually a st st stochastic, stochastic process that is a sequence of events which the outcome at any stage depends on some probability. And the Markov process, which is a type of stochastic process, has the following properties. Okay, the possible outcome of states, the sorry, the number of possible outcome or state is finite. So in this case, the final outcome, which is the dessert choice, is always gonna be one of the three. There's finite, she cannot choose some other dessert she wants to. There's only three here, and this model will work. Okay, the outcome of any stage depends only on the outcome of the previous stage. Oops, sorry for that. So the outcome of any stage depends only on the outcome of the previous state. So the outcome to tomorrow will be dependent if I order cake today and if I don't order, let's go for the example. So if I have no coffee and cake today, I can calculate the probability of her ordering one of the three dessert tomorrow. So in this case, it could be, so if tomorrow she's not ordering coffee, there's a 0 0.2 and you times the probability back again. So 0 0.2 times 0 0.7, 0 0.14 probably is ice cream. And there's a, so the, how about the cake will be 0 0.7 times 0 0.8, those 0 0.56. So that will be 0 0.56% that the next day should be ordering a cake. So, so on and so forth. And the probability are constant over time. So the probability will not change on day 25. Because if day, tw day 25, the probability number changes, the whole model doesn't work. So the model doesn't work if you have a constantly changing probability within your data set. It has to be consistent for it to be considered as a Markov process. So what, once we're done with Markov chain, which is this whole chain of events and its probability, uh, we have described the whole thing as a Markov process. What is hidden in a, in a hidden Markov model? So basically this part. So whether you won't know whether she's gonna, so you do not know that her decision of dessert actually is dependent on the coffee. We do not know that. So in a hidden Markov model, we only have the observable outcome, but we do not know the probability, the, the probability as well as the hidden cause of it. So we only know this sequence. So we know she's gonna order cake, two cake, ice cream, jelly, cake, uh, jelly, cake, over and over. So you have about a thousand of this sequence, but you do not know the exact probability of what causes each. But we know that ice cream, so if you order ice cream today, there will be a probability that she'll be ordering jelly tomorrow. And, and we need to find out what is the, we need to reverse engineer the probability. Basically just how to understand woman and the dessert choice in this case. Okay, so, that is what hidden in a hidden Markov model. So we have a chain, a sequence of all the dessert, but we need to know what is the one that causes and how do we know what dessert she's gonna order the next day. So that's basically the, the, the basic application of the hidden Markov model. So HMM, HMM are a formal foundation of making probabilistic model of linear sequence labeling problem. So they're well known for effective for modeling correlation between adjacent events and, and they've been extensively used in various fields. So uh, there'll be two examples I wanna talk about in the bioinformatics. So in bioinformatics, the most obvious sequence that we have are the genetic sequences. So ATGC, 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 and so on. Okay, so in this case, you can actually see from the picture here, which is taken from the paper uh, from 2009, which is an excellent paper. I highly recommend you to go and uh, read about it. So this is a, a, an, an example of how you can model whether a, a gene is a codon, sorry, a gene is exon or an intron based on uh, the certain model. So, so every time, uh, in every gene, there's always what we call a codon bias between intron and antron. Uh, intron and exon, okay? So there's certain characteristic of them. And by using a hidden Markov model, you can actually kind of predict whether some, whether a sequence, uh, a sequence or region is an exon or an intron based on the characteristic. And of course, you need to have labeled data to fit in and you'll be able to put a new sequence in and you should be able to accurately 
uh, tell you which part of the sequence is an exon and which part of the sequence is an intron with a certain probability and you know cutoff and so on and so forth. And this is fairly straightforward. I think that the second one is a little bit more complicated, which is actually using uh, sequence alignment. So, so instead of using a single, so just now we're only modeling a single chain. So A, T, G, C, G, A, C, T, G, C, A, C, A, G, C, A, C, T, T. So this is, you have many, many chains that you train a model and then you fit a new chain in to determine which part of it is an intron and exon. Uh, but however, this is a little bit more complicated, which is using a sequence alignment. So in this case, maybe you have um, a sequence of six different uh, hemoglobin gene, uh, hemoglobin coding genes that you just do a sequence alignment and you build a profile of them. So in this case, how do you build a profile is that you have three different states, a match, an insert and a delete at each of the nucleotide, uh, re nucleotide position. So position one, so, okay, you build a model on this. You've got a new sequence coming in. So the new sequence can be either the same nucleotide, which is T, then you get a match. If it's not a match, then it will, it will be a mismatch. So maybe it's a one and a zero. And there will be also two more possible situations. There could be an insert, which is one extra nucleotide uh, on position one, or it can be a delete, means there's no position on, there's no nucleotide on that position. So you can be a M, I, or D. So in this case, it's just one and zero, whether there's a match, there's an insert, or there's a delete at that specific region. Okay, then you can do this again and again and again for how many sequence long that you want, and then you can build a profile of it. So let's say you have built your model based on 20 or 30 different hemoglobin sequences, and you have a new sequence of gene, and you don't know what it is. So you put it in this model. Um, if 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 it actually fit, fits the model, then most likely it is the same family gene. But if it doesn't, then it's not. So how to think of it is like a like think of your model when you do linear modeling where you draw a straight line across uh, a lot of different data points. So if you put a new data point and it falls directly on the line, means the new data point you put in is very similar to the data point that you have previously because they fit in the same model. If it's completely off the, the rail, it's completely off the line, means most likely that it not belongs to the same, uh, what is that called? The same family, and most likely that a gene from a completely different function, family, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it, it actually does sound a little bit like RNN, recurring, recurring neural network, which is actually also using the similar concept of analyzing a chain and try to predict whether the the next thing in line is yeah actually it's a chain of event where you try to predict the next in line with a certain probability or you try to see if a certain chain of event fits another chain of event and they're similar or not so they do functionally very similar but their approach is very different so first of all um, the hidden markov model are only able to remember what is happening a one step before or a few steps beforehand. Yes, uh, there are ways to get around it. That way you can do the matrix here and there and you can profile them with hidden, with more hidden state and so on. But uh, compared to recurrent neural network, such as like OSTM, GRU and Transformers, uh, they're able to remember things that are much, much longer in the, in the chain of the events. They can remember maybe hundreds uh, neuron or 200 neurons or 100 state or 200 state behind. No, no, actually, they're able to remember 100 neurons behind them, but the hidden Markov model can only remember one state. So state is using hidden Markov model, neurons is using RNN. Okay, and the second thing is that hidden Markov model relies strongly on the Markov processes and the Markov um, uh, assumption, which is that the, there's a certain... Uh, which is there is a certain probability that certain things will happen. Like in the ice cream example, uh, we we know that the the ice cream is related to the cake. We know that there's a probability that that one the ice cream is related to the cake, and there's not much of a complicated situation in between, and the probability will always be the same. And that might not work in a lot of things like language processing or natural language understanding and reproducing and so on. So a lot of time maybe H&M works for a single paragraph, might not work for the next paragraph. 
because it, it doesn't understand things. The probability of a words changes, but RNN are able to work with that much better. And um, yeah, they are also much more memory efficient. Actually, that is one of the biggest. I believe that's one of the biggest thing. I'm not too sure about that. So um, HMM has not been very successful in the language field. Particularly, maybe they're not able to train. Uh, things that are that big, the network size, I think, are not as efficient compared to transformers. And they are also having trouble to remember things that are in the beginning of the paragraph, let's say. They only remember two or three state behind them. So uh, one of the examples that was included in the paper here is that uh, HNM are very inappropriate for RNA secondary structure analysis, where conserved RNA base pair include long range pairwise correlation. Uh, one position might be be any residue, but the pair, but the base pair partner might be complementary, and H and N state path has no way of remembering what a distant state generated, and they're not able to process the kind of thing as efficiently as RNN and GRU. So basically, we talk through what is a Markov chain, what is a Markov process, and what is hidden in a hidden Markov model, and how we can use them, and the two application that we have in bioinformatics, and what actually has been changed and and actually have been a newer process. I, I wouldn't say it's a replacement. Each has their different thing that they do better, but you know they are, they are fundamentally very different in their glory dump. So that's all I want to say for today. I would say thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.